Right, so um, we're in setup. Snapping doesn't matter right now. And we're in a camera view, but that's that's not so important. I'm going to go to perspective view. And in setup, I'm actually, actually going to just do everything in setup because it's possible. This is probably not the best way to do it. Um, you know, because here's the reason why I'll do everything in setup. It's because I kind of can. At the top left here, you can adjust your setup setting. So we're usually in setup, but we can also just go to modeling and create some objects. So I'm going to quickly do that just for the sake of the tutorial, okay? But just know that if you really need to go back to modeling, just click on the model tab and create something. Um, so under setup, just so you know it's possible, we go to the model tab, we create a cube. All right. Hello, Mr. Cube. And a new mesh, and we'll create a sphere. All right. So we have a sphere and a mesh, and um, we can just move them around a little bit. So I'm going to move that thing out the way. So remember, I don't know if you guys remember, but I do this thing where I go down just below the transform notes and we hit the zero button here. You know, the zero on the right hand side. You see where my mouse is right now? Over here. You see we use the zero all function. So I like to do that when I'm animating as well because it also like, because some it animates according to the center of the object. And so if the center's off, sometimes animations can be wonky. So this is just like a... It's just like a coverall basis tactic that I have in case something happens. So like for example, if I've moved polygons, like I move the polygons over here and then you can see my, my, my center's all the way over there. And now when I want to pick something up, um, you see my center's off. And so we can go through the same process. Remember, center to bounding box. Hello. Center to bounding box and then zero everything. And we do that just so that Moto thinks everything's in its center and can be quite effective for animating. And from here, instead of animating, for example, from, look at the weird value numbers it has right now, that you'd have to kind of think about that as zero. So if you're doing something fairly technical where you wanted three things to interweave, I don't know if there's an example right now that you need it for, but there might be. Um, if you want to kind of control something, starting at minus 2.5 and minus 4.8 is just hard. It's not as easy as starting at zero. So... I'm going to zero out this. Now let's go through the animation. Um, bottom of the page, of the setup page, there is this uh, this this piece of white tape with some numbers on it. That is called the timeline. What do we do in the timeline? We scrub through the animation. Okay, and what is scrubbing? Scrubbing is like scrolling in the animation. Um, the audio button, bottom left, we actually haven't used yet, but it's a great way to integrate audio into your animations. We're actually not going to use it for this first part of the animation because it's kind of advanced integration. It's actually using audio to power certain like control points or keyframes. And so you can be really, really kind of complex with the audio. Say you want the sound of an animal to drive the size of a, the size of a wave. You can do that. We're not going to go there yet. Graph editor we've looked at. It kind of gives you the complex way of understanding the movement of the object across the timeline. Um, we're going to just leave this on animated. This here will allow you to move systematically frame for frame between frames. So here we can put in the frame we want to be in. If you just type in a number here, 36. We'll go to frame 36. Okay. So that's a great way to just move between frames. Um, Play will play your animation from start to finish. You can ignore all of these. These play buttons and this button will actually, I will show you some of this a little bit later just because it's they're great tools and interesting to work with. Um, but they are not so important right now because they're about simulation and not about actual animated objects. So let's animate an object. To animate an object, we need to pick up an object. We need to activate a tool. And then we need to affect that tool, but we have to first tell Modo before we affect it where it needs to start and where it needs to go. What do we call that process? What do you call where we tell it where to start? Do you guys remember? It's like a very simple word, keyframes. So this is called keyframing. So I want Modo to know that the sphere and the cube, both of these, are in their kind of original starting positions and I want to animate from here. So what do I do? So there's actually, there are two ways to do this. The one, the way I showed you last week is I can click, just click onto the little circles next to the numbers in, on the right hand side of the screen, right here. And that'll say, okay, Moto, at frame zero, and you can see here the little white dot, at frame zero, 
start the animation. This is the original place. Another way to do it is to pick up a tool like, for example, W, which is the move tool. You'll see when I pick up the move tool, they, they go yellow. The yellow button, I believe, give me a second. The yellow button means that the channel is about to be edited, but it's got no keyframe in it. And so technically when you pick up anything and you press any tool, we should kind of get that effect. You can kind of see it happening here. Um, so, if there's no keyframe, there's no, there's, no, there's no animation. So let's keyframe both of those at zero to the original position and original rotation. We can even do it to scale. So we'll just click those red buttons. Okay, that's one way of doing it. We can just click the buttons and then they get animated. And if you don't want any of the animations, uh, just click inside this, just pull up the scrubber here. At the, if you grab the top of the um, timeline and you pull it up, you can see some kind of advanced editing. This is not the graph editor. This is just an advanced kind of visualization for key keyframes. Um, if you right click, you can delete it. Don't press delete on your keyboard because it will delete the objects in the scene. So Moto sometimes have controllable deletes, okay? So right click delete will allow you to focus delete on something like, for example, what I had deleted here. So I'm gonna right click over here and you'll see there's a delete and delete related, so just delete that. If you press backspace, it's gonna say, do you wanna delete all your items? And that's saying, do you wanna delete the things in your scene? No, um, you probably still do it because that's just the way Moto is. Hello, right click. Okay, so I've deleted those. Let's look at another way to keyframe. So the first way to keyframe, we know we pick up a tool and then we don't even have to pick up the tool. We just grab the thing and we say, okay, we want to animate position, rotation, and scale. If we pick up a tool like move, W, and we press S on our keyboard, it's the shortcut for keyframe. And we'll keyframe any tool that is active. So let's look at what we call pipelining in Modo. So when we grab something in motor, that's the first step of the pipeline. Okay, I've picked up something, right? Think about it as like a task in the wood shop. I say to you, go and cut a hole in this piece of wood. The first thing you do is you pick up the piece of wood and you walk to the workshop, right to the wood shop. And so that's pipeline part number one. So our first thing here is we pick up the objects. The next thing you do when you get to the wood shop is you pick up the tool with which you want to create the hole, right? So in our case, we want to, in this case, rotate, or we want to move, or we want to scale. There is also a tool for all three of those at the same time, which is Y on the keyboard. Okay? You see how all three tools are active right now? So I'll drop my, I'll drop my objects again. I'll just pick up the cube for now. If I press W, I pick up the move tools. You can see it's activating the, the position channels, right? If I press E, it activates the rotation channels. If I press R, it activates the scale channels. If I press Y, it activates all the channels. So, because all three channels are activated, I could press Y on my keyboard and then press S on my keyboard to keyframe everything. So now when I want to do a quick like, animation of this thing, I'm already set that it knows, oh, it's from this starting point, this is original scale, rotation, and, and, and position. Now when I move it, say I want to scrub to like, okay, I'm going to do 120 frames, and we're going to just do one other keyframe. So now when I do any kinds of movement, so if I move it, like so, it's now animated to move to here over the timeline. In this position, if I decide, okay, I'm also going to do a, a weird rotation, uh, 248 degrees, leave it there. That's animated to do that over the timeline. And then the last thing, if I, if I scale now and I decide I'm going to scale it up equally to 500%, that's also animated equally over the timeline. So now if we bring this back to position 1, if I press play, Okay, so 
Y to select all the tools at the same time and S to keyframe. And that doesn't just mean you have to always select everything to press S, right? You could always do this. You could decide at frame 60, okay? Right here, you're happy with the way it's rotating and you're happy with the way it's scaling. But what you're not happy with is the way it's moving. And you actually want a little bit more complex movement in the... You wanted to do something else. And so halfway through the animation, you want to keyframe again. So in this case, instead of trying to animate all three and keyframe all three, just press W to pick up only those tools. So I'm only picking up the move tool. I'm going to hit S to keyframe. Okay. So it means that there's a lock point. So basically, Moto is going to move from 0 to 60 and then 60 to 120. And those positions are the ones it's going to look for along the way, right? So now at position 60, I'm going to move it out a little bit, 10 meters, something like that. And now we can, we can, we can go over the... we can do it again. And now it's going to move this way first. And now it should technically keep going. Oh, I'll tell you what I've done wrong. So we only move this along one axis, right? And we we moved it out this way. It's probably not that easy to visualize from there. So let's have a look from here. Maybe that'll be easier. So as it leaves, it starts to curve right, and then it just kind of straightens up again. And we can go and look at the graph editor. So let's look at the graph editor for position. How do I look at the graph editor for position only? It's quite straightforward. Go and select these three channels. So click on the object. Click on position X, hold shift like you would on any software, you know, if you're like in Photoshop and you want to select lots of layers, hold shift and click on the Z and you'll see it selects all three at the same time. Super useful for selecting lots of info at the same time. Hit the graph at the bottom, bottom left, and let's have a look at what's going on here. So you can really see, you can really see what's happened. And... I'm going to play this again and if you guys can if you guys can visualize and kind of cross reference between the red line and I'll just grab the red line and the action that the the box does that'll be very good okay so let's take it to zero look at the red line and look at the action of the box as well as as carefully as you can do you notice that it slows down about here and then it doesn't continue to move left it just straightens up why is it straightening up why is it not moving down here yet and why is it stopping over here any ideas Uh, an oscillation or something. There's also no more keyframes, right? So technically, this is what we call a constant input, right? So we set it at keyframe 60. We told it, okay, by keyframe 60, I want your value to be, and if we select the keyframe here, I want your value to be 10 meters. After, after keyframe 60, you stay at 10 meters in the X. Don't move from there. And that's what the command is telling it. If we pick up position Y and Z, you can see that they have a very different command, and by the time they get to keyframe 120, they're still being animated doing things. But then at 120, because we have no more keyframes after that, we have constant inputs. How do we keep how do we keep the um, here's a good question. How do we keep it moving left on the on the red axis infinitely forever and ever? Any ideas? We played with these tools briefly on Tuesday. Like how do we advance? You just said something about it. Yeah, so we're going to have a look at some of these tools here. We've already looked at oscillates. If we press oscillate, we get this kind of... Uh, so that would that would give us um, more something more like this. And those other objects are continually disappearing. Let's do this. So that would give us this kind of endless... Uh... All right, so this, you can see the loop. If we change this oscillate to an offset repeat, you will see that it just continues to go down and down and down and down and down. And so that graph, for example, and that's with the smooth, and so if we just do an offset repeat, we maybe get a, a straighter version of it. Um, and if we make it linear, we can make it really constant. And so let's have a look now. Now, technically, it should just continue moving into... Well, hold on. I'm just going to move this to make our 
thing longer. I'm gonna make it 600 so that you can really get a good kick out of this. Okay, let's play it. And you'll see that the animation now just continues to move it left. And technically, if we made our, our timeline infinite, this thing would infinitely move left. Because there's no there's no final keyframe, right? There's only this setting right here. See, it just keeps going. And I'll zoom out here so you can see. It's just going to keep moving along the timeline, right? And that's this. these two kind of set the direction, right? Or the speed that it's going to go. And if I, if I move this, you'll see that it, it, it probably will start to go faster, you know? So, and if I bring it all the way back over here, it'll go really slow because the angle of the, the, the curve is different. So the graph editor is super powerful and like really, really controlling the way things move. And if we come in here and of course, you've already, you've already seen we can, uh, we can grab handles and things like that and we can bend it around so that if we want it to behave really differently, we can. And so now make a prediction. Does anybody want to predict what it's going to do here in that if it just like that, what, what's going to happen? It's going to move out. Look at this very carefully, and it's quite important to do this because if you understand the graph in this way, it will it will put you in kind of a nice position. So let's have a look at this. Have a look at specifically um, position X. Have a look at the way this is working. It's going to move left, right. And then it's going to move right again, because you see how it's going, it's, the number's getting bigger, now the number's getting smaller, and then suddenly it will get really big and drop and move faster to the left. So if we play it, have a look. See how it kind of jerks at the very end and kind of shoots left? That's because if we look at the graph editor, it's going to do that. It's going to do something subtle, and then it's going to quickly drop off and jump to its value. And so you can make this, I mean, you can really, really have lots of control here, depending on what you like. Um, yeah, I advise you just kind of mess with this. until You can really exaggerate things, so it will move. Now it will move far right and then left, right? Do you understand that? That it's going to move far right and then left. So let's have a look at this. <coughs> Far right, and then left. And that's just because of the way the graph is being manipulated. The, I think the only thing that's really confusing is that sometimes you have to. In this case, I'm, 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 I'm. Anything that's a positive number, I understand, is going right, and anything that's negative, I understand, is left. But that's not necessarily always the case. Sometimes it's a bit different. But you just have to read the graph and the and the object movement together. So the graph editor is incredibly powerful incredibly important for animation just because we can have so much more control and then a lot of things like you know if i did want to repeat myself forever and ever and ever listen beforehand people had, before people were doing it this way they had to keyframe each of those this is way better a lot of time spent less time spent doing things um let's keep going so that's um basic animation Alright, so we've animated the object. I have the other object in the scene just for something static that you can look at, right? So we have this object moving around and uh, it's going to do this weird oscillation thing. See the offset repeat happening there? It will oscillate and it's going to jump back and forth and it's going to get further and further and further away. And that's because there's the offset repeat. If I pick up the graph editor, you can have a look. See how it's getting lower and lower and lower? Yeah. So that kind of offset repeat right there is what's going on on my screen where it's slowly pumping out to the left hand side. Okay? So now we've got this set up. We can obviously we can animate uh, we can we can give material to this object just like we would in any scene, right? You know that you can go to shade a tree and you can do the full set of controls here. And I think you all know that we can animate some of the color selection, like some of the tools in here. What's the rule for what we can animate in Modo? <laughs> yes. Anything. So anything can be animated. Anything with a what? With the little circle. It's very important that you know that because if you try and do it else, otherwise, you can get confused and frustrated. You'll see that even things like refractive index are animatable. So if you want an object to like... 
move from a state of glass to a state like you know when ice melts and goes from ice to water the, the 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 quality of refraction changes and so you can animate that inside that kind of melting operation and so we can um, um it can be quite 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 tactical so we've added a color let's add a color i'm going to make it this horrendous yellow pea color there you go um and uh there you go so objects being animated How do we render an animation? I'm, I'm going to, oh, here's, a, here's my first question. How do I set the camera to be the same as my current view? So I've got, in perspective mode, I've been panning around for a while and I've decided that this view right here, just because I was in perspective mode and I'm feeling lazy and I haven't really set up my camera, but I've decided that this shot is perfect for what I want to show. How do I get the camera to snap to this? Ideas? Okay, very straightforward. Click on the camera item in the list. I wish I'd take the stupid notes thing away from the top. Um, go to camera over here. Very crazy. What is going on? So it is there. So click on the camera item, and there's a button just below target distance that says sync to view. And so if I press sync to view, the camera is now matched to my, my view. And so if I pull away with the perspective, you'll see that there is now the camera where my camera used to be. All right. And so if we go to the animations, the, the, the render tab, you'll see the two objects in the scene there. And this thing will just kind of continue to do its thing. Um, you can change the colors. You can even you can animate everything in the environment as well. So if we go into the environments, let's have a look at that. So everything from the kind of environment type. So you can go from like a four color gradient to a constant through your animation. I have no idea why you would do that. Like middle of the animation suddenly change background typologies, but you might. I don't, I haven't quite worked out a reason. Um, some kind of constant, uh, some kind of physically based uh, daylight, something like that. Um, you can control all of those and they all can be animated. Okay. How do we animate something? How do we uh, render an animation? That's my real question. Yeah. You guys figure, I'm sure you figure this out, but you can also, you can, you can clearly animate the lights as well, right? You can animate their, their, qualities and warmth and color changes and position and volumetrics and every er, everything can be animated so if you want to light to flicker like it's an old innkeeper in the rain do it it's possible just go watch a video of a flickering light and try and copy it um, and a lot of it is just to copy the keyframing like when it turns off when it turns on when it dims when it doesn't dim you know and that's a couple of different settings that you control at the same time um, okay, so how do we render an animation? We go to uh, render and we hit an render animation. It's very straightforward. Press that and um, there's some settings here you can add to it. Before we do that, I'd just like to show you where the other render settings are. You guys know that if you click in the shader tree on the render node, right? This is where we set the resolution right here. If you're trying to find good resolution for, um, for your videos, do this. Go and look at YouTube video resolutions. Okay, these are the four basic ones that upload really cleanly to YouTube. This is what I'm going to ask you to use. Most of you will be able to render these two bottom ones pretty comfortably on your PCs, and that's what I expect. If you have a fast computer slash willing to use the render farm slash are very patient render 720 or 1080 because they make really nice videos but we will be using kind of the the resolution as a tool to allow us to prototype things quickly so you'll see in the assignment i've asked you to kind of render things really cheaply in the beginning 
so that we can just understand camera movement and like light qualities as opposed to rendering with all the textures and things like that okay so just go and look for the YouTube resolutions 1080p 720 480 and 360 um, learn them off by heart you'll see that um, this software automatically adds the frame width and the height at 1280 by 720 in pixels just because that's what it does if you press this uh, the gang edit related controls on the right hand side if you press that twice you'll get to the infinity sign and if you change the height from 720 to 480 it will adjust accordingly the number above it okay so proportionally adjust the number above it and you'll see that that's 854 by 480 and hits 853 by 480 much of a muchness this is how we control the size of our resolution. We always render videos in pixels. And you'll see that when I'm asking for still frames, I'm also asking for a pixel resolution in HD. <coughs> so I've, um, I've set up this here. Now we just go to render and we go render animation. But one more thing inside frame. Inside frame, um, you'll see underneath sequence, you can control how long you want the animation to be and what the step will be. Um, whether or not this is important right here is not is, is, isn't the biggest deal. But remember, even if you set your timeline distance to 600 like mine, if you don't update this, last frame here to 600 or 240 or whatever the requirement is it will only render out 10 like 120 frames that's it so when i go to render animation it's actually going to bring up this sequence little sequence dialog you see it's exactly the same thing um here we can set this oh, okay i want i'm going to leave this at 120 frames for now but set it to 240 frame step we want that to be set to one frame step means that every sec every frame is rendered you guys are also, in the beginning, when you're doing the test video animations, let's render as movies, just straight up as a movie, because we want it to be nice and cheap, um, and just kind of get a video that's working. However, when you guys start moving, rendering your final kind of videos for the 26th, and I'll explain the new date in a second, when you start rendering your final videos for the 26th, Render as image sequences because that means that if you need to pause, your computer crashes, your computer shuts down, your little brother closes your computer, your mom decides that it's Sunday and you need to go to church and you've got to re stop rendering, you know, like things like that. Image sequences can be paused at any point and restarted because it's every frame is being rendered as a separate image. Videos are not giving you that middle option right, where there's, a, where there's a, a series of frames you can grab and put somewhere. So we'll get a little bit more in depth with this, but just think about that for now that when we're doing final renderings Image sequencing when we're doing cheap quick test renders. I highly recommend just movie. Okay, once you're done with that press ok choose a spot to render to um, yeah. And it's gonna kind of do this for way too long, so I'm not gonna do this um, but it's gonna render this out and when it's complete, it's going to deposit it as an MOV file. So I'm quickly bought this. Yes. Let's go back here to the frame. And so this is what I'm talking about doing really low quality renders for um, for tests. So I'm going to make that a 144 render. So that's really, really low. Okay, so that's the, the worst resolution you can look at on uh, YouTube. New bad. And so you can see now it's just like flying through the it's flying through the animation. So it should do 120 frames in two minutes. All right. Why is it going so quick? Because I set it to a very, very low resolution. It's only 144 pixels wide and 240 pixels deep. The reason I'm doing this is because I purely am interested in seeing whether the movement of my objects and the movement of my camera are correct. Okay, um, so you can see the object is slowly moving across the screen, and I'm and it, I know it looks really fast, but it just each one of these is a quick render that's happening. 
and uh, you see I'm already at 54% and um, I'll show you my settings again in a second but um, just so you know it's very they're very small you know I'm, I'm not trying to render a big image I'm not trying to get quality graphics I'm just trying to see that my sequencing my camera placement is it shaky is it too fast does it slip does it glitch that's what I'm looking for okay and just because the quality is low doesn't necessarily mean that the animation is wrong right it just means that the quality of the video is low and it's you know using your resources effectively okay so my video is finished being rendered that's really nice so do you guys see that we can do a really quick video render it's really important that you can do that um, desktop let's have a look at this new movie that we just made this is a new horrendous movie we press play and so you can see my object uh, doing its thing across the screen at 120 frames I'd say it's moving too fast but it's great that in, in two minutes I can quickly see what my video looks like right so remember render really low resolution when you want to do tests All right. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stick to the um, animating thing and show you a couple of interesting things with the camera, um, and then I'm give you a break, and then we're going to come back to one or two more moto tricks. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to show you is called the follow me constraint. Okay, so in Modo, there is this great tool that allows the camera to look at something or the camera to follow something. And um, we're going to set that up right now. So I'm going to make a new file. Just because I like to create a new file every time. Go to items. Inside my items, I want two meshes. On mesh number one, I want uh, just some arbitrary objects. Why am I doing that? Because I want some kind of bad cityscape that I can look at. I just want some objects in the scene that, that are not too obnoxious. Okay, so there's my new cityscape, Gotham City. Okay, um, so that's that's. I, I I generally like just. I'm just going to call this content. Okay, so I generally like to have stuff in the scene when we're rendering. Otherwise, it's kind of mindless. Um, and I'm actually going to do the following. I'm going to select content, and I'm going to select everything, and we're going to quickly create a um, use the scatter clone tool just to show you. Scatter clone is great uh, when you pick up scatter clone. It will just it kind of just distributes things randomly across the scene. So here we don't want any change in the Y because we just want to move along the floor. Zero, but we can really spread this out. Let's make it ten by ten. Okay. So you'll see scale. You can you can do that if you want. Um, if I press apply, you'll see it just puts them around. You know, it's just it's a great way of like randomly distributing stuff. So if you need to put trees in a forest, man, don't think about it yourself. Just let, let the machine do the thinking. So I'll quickly undo that. And just to show you, we can do a little bit more. Um, on the Y, I'm gonna, we're going to make this like uh, 180. Um, yeah, there you go. And you can, of course, change the seed if you want it to look different. So there you go. That's a, there's a couple of things in the scene that I, we can just look at. Um, the other thing we like to add, of course, we always add this F6 to bring up your, um, to bring up your, your content browser. Double click on... Shadow Catcher, I'm just adding the Shadow Catcher so that there is a ground so you can see what's happening. Uh, we'll quickly bring up the render and have a look how it looks. So just very quickly using a, and I mean I'm being I'm being quite cheap here with the with the render, but like just very quickly I create a, a quick cityscape with something to fly through. Shadow Catcher is always critical. Next thing on mesh number two. We're going to create a path for the camera to follow. Okay, so the best way to do this is the following. I like to pick a side view, something like a right view or something like that. So go to perspective, go to a right view. All right, once I'm in my right hand view, I like to, you need to click on basic. So just watch what I'm doing here so you can see where this tool is because it's a bit hidden. Click on basic, 
I click on the pen tool and click and hold until I find the curve tool, okay? Grab my curve, and then I start to drag my curve out, okay? So I'm going to do something like this. And so that line that I'm drawing, and of course, you know, you can adjust this afterwards. That line that I'm drawing will go to the top. So it's right there. But we could also make it, you know, okay, I want you to turn a corner there. And we're just adjusting so that it does a cool fly through. Um, yeah, that looks good. Okay, so now let's have a look in, in perspective mode. Let's have a look at what that thing's doing. That 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 curve kind of shoots down through into Gotham City and then show, you know does its thing. Um, we'll make it a bit taller just because it would be cool, no? Okay, so there you, there you can see the camera is going to do well. The thing that I want to fly through here is going to fly along that path. Can you just stupid thing? So there you go. Um, gray path is the uh, is the path we're going to follow. I'm going to have selected. Right there, you guys see. Cool. So now we have the path selected. We have a camera and we have content to look at. Now we want to send the camera along the pathway. Okay. So let's do that. We in setup mode. Best best mode to be in setup. So this is where we're going to get into some of the setup tools here. This is the first time we're really looking at some of these setup tools. Let's look at them. So setup tools, we've got setup here, which is about curves and skeletons. We're actually going to look at skeletons today, um, just because it might be a bit helpful for animating some things. We're going to look at command regions, note modifiers, and this is where we want to stay right now. We'll get into this other stuff later, but right now you want to go to modifier. So you'll see in modifiers, there's constraints. Underneath constraints, let's have a look. Position, rotation, direction, vertex position, particle position, path, intersection line, and UV. There's some new ones that we're seeing as well, but for now, we're going to be looking at path, and we'll be looking at direction constraints as well just now. So let's do it. Select the camera. I'm going to rename this pathway. To the pathway so I don't get confused. So I have a pathway and I have a camera. We select both of them at the same time, like so. Oh, pathway and then the camera. Okay, so camera item and the curve mesh item, right? So this is what I'm doing. Sorry, I just had to. If you're ever confused about a tool and it doesn't want to work, often if you click the tool when it's disengaged, it'll tell you, like, hey, do it this way. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it's telling me, grab the camera, then grab the pathway. Okay? Once I've done that, I'm going to literally just hit the path button. And you'll see that the camera gets placed at the top of the line. All right. So now that we've done that, okay, camera's now on the top of the line. So you missed a fair amount in the last three minutes. Um... Once you get there, you'll see that there is a um, underneath next to the pathway. There's a little plus sign, and next to the camera, there's a little plus sign. When you when you open that plus sign out, you'll see there's a path constraint pathway. In here, there's some tools, and guess what? They're also animatable, just like everything else. But the thing that's really important is that path percentage is the is the distance it's covered along the pathway. Okay, so. We're going to go here. We'll start at zero. How do we keyframe? We press the button to keyframe like normal. I'll go to 120, and at the end of 120, we'll put that at 100%. And so now when we go here, we'll press play. Play. Come on. Wait, I forget to do something. Yes. At 120, we'll make that 100%. And we'll keyframe it there. So now animation is ready. So the camera is going to fly along the cable. So that's how you make like a roller coaster that way quite effectively. So let's have a look at it in camera view. So this is a great reason to use the camera in this way. We'll go over here and we'll press play and we'll see if we like it. And so it flies along our curve and if we've got bumps in the curve, it kind of affects that. Um, of course, if we create, if we make a much longer timeline, so if I make this over like 600, and I'm going to do that just to show you guys. Oh, not 60, stupid thing. 
So we do a 600, and we grab the same idea, and then we go to frame 120. And at frame 120, we can pick this up, right? Grab those, and just drag them all the way over. So it's here. Okay. And now I go to zero, press play, and now we can watch this thing moving much slower through the... It'll get there in a sec. And of course, if you had like an image in the background and landscape, it would all just show up and focal blur. They all come kind of into this. And so we can get really kind of complex about how our cameras work. Um, okay, let's have a look at a few things. You can roll it as well as you're going. So if you want the camera to tilt and pan as you're kind of going along the path, you can do that. Um, <laughs> Path offset is like how far away from the, the path you want the object to be. Uh, do you want like an up vector? So if you want to look in a different direction, you can do that as well. Um, what else? Okay, so that's the, ca that's the camera moving through. And of course, this, the longer time you give it to do the, the motion, the slower it will be, of course. Um, and then, uh, one other thing. You'll notice that the camera doesn't see a lot of stuff as it's going, but that's because it's got a very, very tight focal lens right now, okay? So if we made that two, it probably will improve this experience a little bit. Yeah, so if we made it 22, you'll see we get a lot more of the build, because we're just opening the lens up, okay? So we're getting a lot more of the buildings during the flight time. It actually feels a little bit more real because, you know, like human eyes, we're quite broad, actually. All right. So much better already. Um, okay, so that, that, is, that is camera pathway. Um, I have one more thing to show you guys now. Let me quickly do that, and then you guys can take a, a lunch break. Um, so this is what we need. We now want, in our scene, we want an object that as the camera flies past it, we want it to look at the object. We want it to look at the camera. Like, so, or we wanted to follow the camera around. So if, if it was like just some weird creeper dude in the middle of your scene, like we want the, the camera to follow, we want that object to follow. So bear with me for a second here. Um, I just want to quickly um, create a bit more density in here. Scatter clone. Great. Um, our pathway, which by the way is um, currently, you see how it intersects things right now? We can adjust it very easily. So I'm going to bring it out here and just make sure it's not flying through anything that's crazy. Yeah? Lift things where they need to be lifted. Shall we have a look at the fly through right now? Just to have a look. Okay, so there we have that thing flying through. It's, it kind of it looks like it's a much more exciting to look at now. So now what we can do is we can put a. Um, I'm going to just do this with a very simple tactic. I'm going to create a mesh, and un in that mesh, I'm going to create a very basic flat panel. Okay. This is for application for something I'll show you a little bit later. Um, so you see how that flat panel like that. I'm hoping this is going to be obvious enough when we do this. Um, it's kind of in a weird position, but I'll put it here anyway. So that's sitting on top there. Yeah, maybe I think this one looks good. Okay, so he, he's over there, and um, I'm hoping there's a moment in this um, in this camera track where, as we go down through the city. Looking good. Is that it right there? Yeah, that's it. Hey. So, look, I, I'm I'm hoping you guys notice that editing and creating a great animated camera setup is not a small job, and I'm trying to go quite quickly here. Um, and I just want to make sure that we can we can see the the, the kind of interesting things that I'm trying to show you. So. Okay, so it's going to go right up into the face of that thing. That looks about right. Okay, so I've done that. I'm going to grab this. I'm going to give it a material that's horrendous. Horrendous. You know, just something that's very loud. Um, did I not do that? Yeah. 
foreign okay so we have that bright color um, I just want to scrub back a little bit here to about here and let's have a look at the um, the camera yeah so that's now kind of you know as we fly through oh, we get a good view of it right there as we go down and we get another view of it over here okay so <coughs> sorry for the long-winded setup now let's get to the real juicy bit so what we want Moto to do is we want the face of that thing that that orange thing or at least part of it to as the camera flies to rotate to kind of keep looking at it like a billboard that follows you let's do that so same thing as before we're gonna go to our setup to our setup tab is this little like bone looking thing at the top here the two cogs sitting inside of each other we can go from there we're gonna go to modifiers um, we're gonna grab the face that we want to modify and we're gonna grab the camera that we want to, to follow and we're going to use the direction constraint select an item to be constrained followed by the items to constrain to so we want to constrain that face direction to the camera direction constraint uh oh something a bit crazy here well, I think it's not so what is it looking at hold on hold on Yeah, it's not working. Mm, no, we had this working a second ago. Very irritating. So yeah, because basically we want this thing to look at this thing. Oh, I know what I did wrong. Hey, does anybody have a good idea? Just if somebody knows us off the top of their head, what I'm gonna do to try and fix this. It would be really interesting to know if you guys have already kind of got to this point. Does anybody have like a, a vague clue? Just having a look at this, okay? Watch what happens. This is just like a tactical question about Moto. If, it doesn't mean anything if you know this or not. I'm using the right thing. I know it's a direction constraint, okay? So when I hit this button, you see how this thing pops all the way out of control? It just like flies out here. And when I scrub through this, it seems to be doing something really weird. Does anybody have an idea of why that's happening? We, I have it tied to the camera, but that's on purpose, okay? But, have a look at the scene. Have a look at what's going on. Look at that blue line. Look at what it's pointing at. And look at where the object is kind of moving around. And think if there's like something that I've done wrong with a red with a red faced block, or I've forgotten to do. I keep repeating it. I keep saying I always do this when something's not good. So I need to center it, because right now it centers in the middle of the scene. And it is off to the side. So I'm going to undo that a few times. It's back there. It's no longer connected. I'm going to grab this thing. See my center is all broken. I think this is going to fix it. So we're going to go here, edit, center to bounding box, center, right in the middle. Next thing we go transform, zero it out just because this is just me being paranoid schizophrenic. And I always do this. I actually don't know if it's important or not, but I found often it really helps things. It also helps my brain just feel like things are more in control. And so let's try this again. Select the object, select the camera, select the direction. So now we're getting better. Yeah, kind of. I would say our orientation is incorrect right now. So there's a way to resolve that. Um, so do you guys see that when we grab the object, our red axis faces one way and our blue axis face another way? You see that? So if we press 7 on our keyboards, 7 will allow us to grab the center item. So it's now treating that axis thing, the red, blue, and green directional thing, it's treating that as an object. And I can grab that and I can rotate it. So I'm actually, I'm not rotating the object, I'm rotating the, rotating the center object. And so I'm doing that because I realized when I did the last thing, it was orienting the face, that thin face, as the front. And so I want to change the front of the object. So I'll, just, I'll edit that zero it out and then we'll try it one more time with a five and, a maybe eight. and we'll do a direction constraint yeah okay so let's have a look render camera 
So it's going to turn away from there, but when we get to here, it's facing you. Okay, and so if we have another camera or if we just look at the object fly through the scene, I'll disconnect everything so you can see and I'll just press play. Watch the red, watch the red face slowly rotating to follow the camera. Sweet. That's how animals are. They follow the things around. So I, I think we could do some pretty smart like like follow me things. Okay, so that's that's that. And so if I go to my uh, let's go to render. Let's do a quick render setup. Quick one, and then whilst you guys are away getting some lunch and taking a break, I will render this out. I also have to step out. Instant. Yeah. So really low, okay. Uh, render. Let's make this. Um, I don't know if I want to render this over six hundred um, under six, over six hundred frames. So I'm going to go back to my pathway, uh, to my co pathway constraints. Over here, I'm going to slide this down to two forty two forty frames. Okay, just to make a ten second animation. Um, okay, great stuff. Um, render animation. It's going to render the path, the camera that I have, and I've only got one camera in my scene. Render animation, last frame, 240. It's a movie. We press OK. Yeah, new fly through. All right. Guys, um, 